Hi, uh, my name is Madhav Zulajani, and I'm here to talk a little bit about control theory and concurrent garbage collection. Um, a little bit about me, I get super excited about systems -y stuff, and that's part of the reason why I'm here today, to share some of that excitement with you all. Uh, I spend a lot of my time in the Kubernetes community, mainly in areas of API machinery, uh, scalability, architecture, and contributor experience. So if any of these areas are something that is of interest to you and maybe you'd like to get started in, please feel free to reach out. Okay, so um, let's get started. A brief overview of our agenda today is as follows. We'll do a quick introduction of what control theory is. We then we'll take a look at what a typical Go application looks like. Then we'll introduce ourselves to the component, which is the GC Pacer, which we will be diving deep into today. Um, we'll look at what the GC Pacer looked like prior to Go 1.18. We'll look at how the redesign was done, why it was done, and some of the effects of this redesign and what you might see in your uh, applications as well. We'll look at how this change affected a Kubernetes release, uh, how it caused the release blocker and what our learnings from it were. Maybe if you, look, uh, if you experience some of these effects in your clusters or your Go applications, um, you, we might take a look at how to mitigate some of these effects as well. And finally, we'll end with a small note on the Go 1.19 soft memory limit feature that was recently added. Okay, awesome. So uh, control theory, let's start off with a brief introduction. Before we start formalizing things, um, let's take a, an intuitive example of a hello world um, application of control theory. So let's say that we have a room. Uh, the room has an air conditioner, which controls the temperature of the room. The, we also have a thermostat, which then uh, controls the air conditioner, subsequently then controlling the temperature of the room. So the temperature of the room, let's say right now, is 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, we would like it to be 25 degrees Celsius, and we tell the thermostat that, hey, you know what? 25 degrees Celsius seems ideal. So let's uh, try and maintain that. Uh, so the thermostat knows where we want to go. Uh, the thermostat also gets feedback in terms of what the current temperature of the room is, and it's also able to apply corrective action in terms of manipulating the air conditioner and uh, increasing the temperature, decreasing the temperature, and so on. So it gets feedback saying that the temperature right now is 30 degrees Celsius. I would like it to be 25 degrees Celsius. So uh, in order to get to where we need to go, it applies some form of corrective action. And assuming everything is ideal, the temperature control of the air conditioner is impeccable. There are no external influences. Um, the thermostat is like, you know what, let's go ahead and cool by 5 degrees Celsius. And the room actually cools by exactly 5 degrees Celsius, and we are now at where we want to be, which is 25. And the thermostat sees that we are at 25 degrees Celsius. Awesome. Uh, there is no parity between where we want to go and where we are at, so there is no need to take corrective action further. So this is a very basic example of what a controller does. A controller tries to control a system that evolves over time and such a system which is also influenced by external factors. So in our room, there could be external factors such as the weather outside um, or the humidity of the room or maybe even what you've had for dinner or lunch. So depending on what, how things are proceeding. So now that we've gone through the intuitive example, let's try and formalize things just a little bit. So uh, defining a few terms here, SV, which is uh, the set variable, is what we hope to achieve. PV, which is the process variable, is the output of the system. And the error is essentially the difference between the uh, set variable and the process variable. So putting all of these formalized terms back into our diagram, we see that the process variable is 30 degrees Celsius, the set variable is 25 degrees Celsius, and the error is uh, 25 minus 30. Uh, another important control theory principle before we sort of move ahead is the principle of transient and steady state. Um, if we take another example of, let's say we have a spring, we attach a small weight to the end of the spring and we sort of l drop it down, we will first notice that the spring sort of oscillates up and down, and then finally after a while it sort of stabilizes, calms down, and rests and in, a, in an elongated state because of the weight attached at the end. This initial oscillation that happens is essentially because uh, of noise in the system. And this noise and the state that the system is in is what is known as the transient state. And this elongated state that it finally calms down and rests in is known as the steady state. So if we were to translate that understanding back into our example of a, of a temperature control room, it would look something as follows. So if we plot out the temperature versus time, 
we have our set variable at 25 degrees Celsius. And let's say the temperature of the room goes from 27 to 22. Realistically, the output of the controller might look something like this, because it's never accurately going to adjust the temperature uh, to exactly what we need it to be. So realistically, the output might look something like this. So um, at, point, at times, it might overshoot the goal. At times, it might undershoot the goal. But after it's sort of tried and been through the noise, it stabilizes at a point. And this is the no what we know now as the steady state. The error in the steady state that it um, accumulates is what is known as the steady state error. Um, so that point over there is controller in a possible transient state. Um, and then after it stabilizes, the controller is in a possible steady state, and so on and so forth. So now whenever a disturbance occurs in the system, we enter a transient state because the controller is sort of noisy now. and then it tries to drive itself to a steady state, basically stabilizing the system that it's trying to control. Uh, so all in all, the lifetime of a controller can be looked at as a series of steady states stringed together by a series of transient states. Um, however, things aren't this ideal as we saw. What if the adjustment that we apply overshoots or undershoots the set variable? Can we take past experiences into account and adjust accordingly? Or in other words, can we compensate? Or for example, if we know that cooling by 3 degrees Celsius actually cools it by 3.5 degrees Celsius from our past experiences, can we take that into account somehow? Uh, can we look at our current state and predict what the state is going to be in the future? To answer some of these questions, we introduce an, another set of controllers known as the PID controller, or the PID control. So uh, P stands for proportional. I stands for integral, and D stands for derivative. Uh, let's take a quick look at what each of these uh, components mean and uh, how they tie into Go and garbage collection soon. So uh, P, proportional control, it adjusts proportional to the error that we saw. Uh, this is essentially the thermostat example uh, that we saw. Advantages of using a P controller are that it's simple, it's easy to reason about, and we have minimal state to maintain. There are quite a few disadvantages, though. Um, it's very prone to under and overshoot. The steady state error that we talked about practically never converges to zero in a P controller. And um, finally, and most importantly, we have the problem of proportional droop. What proportional droop essentially means is the equation that we see of the graph over there, if the error term somehow becomes zero, that essentially means that the output of the controller is going to become zero. Um, and if the error persists to be zero, it means that the, there is going to be no controller output. Uh, this is something that we don't ideally want because intuitively an error of zero indicates that everything is correct, everything is going good, which means that the output of the controller should be equal to the process variable, not zero. So in order to have a non-zero output, we need to deliberately introduce some error into our controllers just so that we can introduce like a, a non-zero output. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in detail very soon. So um, that's proportional group. Then we have the integral controller, which is adjusts based on the error that has uh, been in the past. That is, this takes into account uh, previous experiences. The advantage is that uh, with the help of an integral component, we can drive the steady state error to zero. Uh, and the disadvantage is that this is too prone to over and undershoot. But there are ways to sort of tune and make sure that this doesn't happen as often. Um, then finally, we have the derivative component, which is adjusts based on how the error is changing. So it takes the rate of change of error. If we are at a point where the rate of change of error, rate of change of error is negative, which means that the rate of change of error is actually reducing, can we maybe take that into account and make a corrective action anticipating what the future might look like at this point of time? So. Um, it's great for applying corrective actions. It speeds up the time it takes to reach the steady state, which is always a good thing, uh, because we would like our system to be stable as soon as possible. However, a big disadvantage is that it is highly, highly sensitive to even the slightest forms of noise. Uh, so we can now combine these different types of controllers and uh, use the advantages of some, and then use another to mitigate the disadvantages of another. For example, we can use a P controller only, if that's our use case, or we can use a PI controller, which we will soon see, or we can use a P, I, and D controller, um, if, that, if that's what your use case demands. Okay, so um, now that we have like a brief overview of control theory for now, uh, 
let's take a small look, let's take a look at what a typical Go application might look like, right? So let's say we have an application with a Go max prox value of four. Uh, this essentially means that at any given point of time, we are going to have four running Go routines. So we have our four running Go routines. Each Go routine has its own stack. Uh, we have the heap memory and globals. Now each running Go routine might allocate memory as well. This allocation might happen on the stack. This allocation might happen on the heap, or it can happen on both. Uh, over a period of time, this, our application is going to accumulate garbage. And by garbage, I mean memory that is not used anymore and that is just taking up space. To sort of deal with this, we can do a few things. We can do manual memory management, what, which is what we do in programming languages like C. Or we can employ the uh, help of a garbage collector, uh, which is what Go does. So there are a few ways to do the garbage collection as well. One way to go about it would be to stop the application as a whole and then perform a garbage collection. Uh, so we stop all application go routines and run our GC. Uh, we clean up the garbage, application resumes. Second way to go about it, because the previous way would take serious application latency hits because we're essentially stopping the application as a whole for the entire duration of the garbage collection. The second way would be to do things concurrently. That is, what if we could run, if not the entire garbage collection cycle, at least parts of the garbage collection cycle concurrently with the application. So uh, our application is running, we are doing garbage collection. Go does garbage collection this way. However, there is a very important uh, factor to keep in mind here. While the garbage collection is occurring, we are also allocating memory. We are potentially also allocating memory at the same time. So while we are cleaning up garbage, we are also producing potential new future garbage to clean up as well. And this is the crux of the problem as to why Go does things the way that it does today, and uh, the problem that we're going to de dive into deep, deep dive into today. So how does Go do GC? Before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about um, the two types of Go routines that exist from a garbage collector's point of view. The first type are, are something known as mutators. Mutators are essentially application go routines, which uh, are executing application logic and in the process maybe even allocating memory. The second type of uh, go routines are collectors, which are essentially go routines executing garbage collection. Considering mutators and collectors will run together concurrently at some point, there is a fundamental trade-off that is involved here. So let's consider the following. We have some amount of total CPU usage that we have. In this total CPU usage, we have some amount being used by the mutators, which is our application, and some amount being used by the collectors, which is our garbage collection go routines. Now, the trade-off involved here is that over a period of time, if our collectors use more and more CPU, it means that our application go routines don't get as much CPU as it should have, which means our application latencies spike up. But on the other hand, since our garbage collection is aggressively and diligently doing work, our application memory footprint is also going to be low. So um, the trade-off involved here is between application latencies and application memory footprint. And the runtime provides us a knob to sort of tune this trade-off, which is essentially GoGC. So um, if we try and understand GoGC a little bit better, let's try and do that. So if HM, is the size of the objects that were marked live uh, at the end of a garbage collection cycle. And HG is the value to which we are, allow we are willing to let the memory footprint grow before we start the next TC cycle. We can essentially calculate it. The, the HG is calculated as follows. Um, it's calculated as a multiple of the live heap size. So um, GoGC essentially allows us to define how much memory we are willing to let our program use before we start a garbage collection cycle. So the default value of GoGC set by Go is, uh, is 100. So if we plug 100 into that formula, we get HG to be twice of HM, which is basically uh, we would want our heap to grow twice before we start the next garbage collection cycle. Um, and this is what the runtime documentation also defines for GoGC. So uh, before we move any further, let's talk a little bit about the concept of mark assists. So taking a look at our application again, if our application is allocating memory, there might be instances where a go routine might start aggressively allocating memory. 
at a rate which is faster than our garbage collector could keep up with. What this essentially means is our garbage collector uh, essentially means is unbounded heap growth for our program because our garbage collector isn't able to keep up with the rate of allocation that is happening. Um, and this obviously is a very severe issue. So the way that Go deals with this is uh, the, the runtime enlists this Go routine, the, this aggressively allocating Go routines help in helping with garbage collection work because it's only fair that this Go routine, which provided us with this lot of unforeseen garbage collection work, helps us with the work that it's provided us with. So um, it enlists the help of this aggressively allocating Go routine, and this is what is known as a mark assist. Mark assists are essentially a reactive way. Uh, to keep memory usage stable in unstable conditions at the expense of CPU time. Uh, we don't want to rely on mark assists a lot. We want to tr minimize the ut utilization of mark assists as much as possible because assists essentially mean that we are stealing CPU time from application go routines and giving it to the garbage collector. And that's something that might not be uh, the best thing to do, but it's something that might be essential to do. Awesome. So uh, the question that we need to answer is, when do we start a garbage collection cycle, right? So prior to Go 1.5, the garbage collector was a fully stop the world collector, which was the first type of garbage collection that we saw. All application Go routines, all running application Go routines are stopped, and we perform a garbage collection cycle, which means, more importantly, that there are no allocations that are allowed to happen during the garbage collection cycle. This means that we could start a cycle when the live heap size grows to our heap goal, because we aren't allocating anything in between, so it's safe to start it at that time. This gives us simplicity and predictability in terms of heap growth, which is great, but it also takes an, a latency hit, which is not so great. Um, but now, mutators and collectors run concurrently, which means allocations happen during the concurrent marking phase of the garbage collection cycle, which means if we were to start the garbage collector when the live heap reaches the heap goal, we would always overshoot our goal because once we started at that time, we also have applications allocating memory while the GC is running. So we are always, always going to be above our heap goal, and that's something we don't want to do. So how do we still respect that? We need to start early. We need to preemptively start our garbage collection cycles, garbage collection cycle. But the question of early is how early? And that's exactly what the GC pacer tries to answer. So the GC pacer has two fundamental goals in mind. One is to maintain a target GC CPU utilization. Now, there are two facets to this first goal. The first facet being that if we overutilize CPU, means that we are starving application go routines, so we don't want to do that. Now, if we underutilize CPU, which means we aren't doing as much GC work as we should have been, meaning that we aren't completing GC in a timely manner, meaning our memory footprint is going to be uh, higher for a longer period of time, which is also something that we don't want. So we try and maintain a target GC CPU utilization. And the second goal is get the size of the live heap as close to the heap goal as possible. Now, these are two optimization goals that the GC pacer tries to use as guidelines in order to answer the question, how early should we start a garbage collection cycle? So uh, a note before we move ahead. It helps to think of the pacer as a level trigger system as opposed to an edge trigger system. What this essentially means is the pacer concerns itself with a macro view of the system um, and cares about the behavior that is aggregated over a period of time. It doesn't really associate itself with moment to moment individual allocations that happen in our Go programs. So instead, it expects the application to settle in some state, which is essentially the steady state. Uh, and all of the goals that the GC pacer des, uh, defines is for the steady state. Okay, so the steady state of, we've we mentioned steady state a few times, right? But the steady state is defined as follows. In each GC cycle, we expect, a if we have constant allocation rate, which means our application is allocating, uh, the rate of allocation in each GC cycle is roughly the same. Uh, if in each GC cycle, our heap size is roughly the same, and in each GC cycle, our heap composition is roughly the same. What I mean by heap composition is um, if the nature of objects and the size of objects is roughly the same in each GC cycle, it's essentially meaning our heap graph that we have roughly looks the same in each GC cycle. Um, we have constant heap, uh, heap composition. And this is what the steady state entails currently. 
So let's start diving deep into the GC Pacer. The, let's, so the GC Pacer prior to Go 1.18 is as follows. If we again look at the CPU utilization, right, and we talk about our first goal, which is target CPU utilization. We might, uh, we spend some time in background utilization, which is dedicated marking. We spend some time in application CPU usage. And initially it was postulated that our target CPU utilization for the GC should be 25% and our application CPU usage can be the remaining of it. However, due to a few issues that we will soon talk about, this 25% is extended now to 30%, uh, to five more percent, which is essentially 30%. And this extra 5% is dedicated for mark assists. Uh, we, we will soon see why this is the case. But essentially, our background utilization target for the GC pacer prior to go 1.18 is 30%. Um, and we try to minimize, the runtime tries to minimize mark assists as much as possible. I say the runtime because this is a decision in which even the scheduler is involved. But we won't be touching on that today. Um, optimization goal two is get the size of the live heap as close to the heap goal as possible. We have multiple sources of GC work. We have the heap, we have the stack, and we have the globals as well. Uh, stacks and globals are, are typically GC roots, which means that they have pointers pointing into the larger heap memory when we start scanning the heap graph. The previous pacer that is prior to Go 1.18 did not take into account uh, uh, GC sources of work of stacks and globals. It only considered heap sources of work. And this was because it assumed that the other sources of work were negligible compared to the heap. Um, and from a previous discussion, we now see that the HM over here is essentially the amount of heap memory that is marked live at the end of a GC cycle. So as we saw, as I, as I said, we only consider the heap source of work. So if we consider our heap size, we, if we know what the size of the live heap is, and we know what the goal heap uh, size is, we, can, we need to try and determine a size in between of the heap at which we should preemptively start a GC cycle. So that is HT. HT is the size of the heap at which we need to start a GC cycle. We determine this value by using our optimization goals as guides, or more formally, as constraints. Um, we know where we are currently, we know where we'd like to be, and given this, how do we compute this value of HT? The Go GC pacer made use of a proportional controller in, or in order to do this previously. So let's take a look at what this controller did and uh, what some of the nuances of this were. So how does the controller work? We could adjust the trigger point based on how much the heap overshot or undershot in the previous cycle. So if the CPU, if the memory usage was above our heap goal, which means that we should have started uh, much earlier on and we didn't have enough time to complete all of the GC work that we had, means that we should start a little earlier in the, in the previous cycle. If we undershot the heap goal, means that we started too early and we probably should start a little bit later in the next cycle. Uh, this is intuitively, this makes a lot of sense intuitively. However, it does not take into consideration our first optimization goal, which is target CPU utilization. So uh, as I said, it doesn't take into account the target CPU utilization. So the question that we now ask ourselves is, assuming that we are at our goal CPU utilization, that is at 30%, how much would the heap have grown since the last cycle? So what this means is, if, let's say, we, we notice that our CPU utilization is actually double, uh, what this means is, this is probably because we ended up doing double the amount of scan work that we anticipated we would do, and that's also maybe because the heap grew to twice the size it should have. Uh, this essentially means that we didn't have enough time in order to complete all of the GC work that we did have to complete. Mean, meaning we should try and start the GC cycle earlier on in the next uh, in the next cycle. So using these two parameters, it tries to sort of adjust how early or how late the trigger uh, should be set for the GC cycle. So uh, we're essentially now in an optimization problem where we try to optimize for the value of HT, considering our two optimization goals. Okay, so um, if the heap does end up overshooting, right, it's not like we are always going to be on target. If it does end up overshooting, there should be a maximum amount to which this should be allowed. It, it shouldn't unboundedly overshoot. Uh, 
So this is defined as the hard heap goal. The, and in previously, this was arbitrarily set to 1.1 times the heap goal that is calculated in the current cycle. Now, let's talk about assists a little bit. And this is where things start to get a little interesting. So ideally, in the steady state, we should not do any mark assists. This is because um, in the steady state, we should be able to correctly, and, uh, correctly estimate how much GC work we have, and we, which essentially means we should be able to correctly determine how early or how late we should start a GC cycle. But there are cases where in the steady state as well, we have to introduce mark assists, otherwise things probably aren't going to go as planned. And this is because it, the way the error term of the P controller was formulated uh, in the design of the GC pacer earlier, it was possible that the error term could become zero even if our optimization goals were not met. And this, was the prob this is the problem of proportional group that we spoke about. Um, if the error term becomes zero, essentially means that the controller is going to produce zero output, meaning that it's not going to adjust its, uh, the trigger point anymore. It's going to just assume that everything is good because look, there's no error. And it's going to think it's fine, but it's not really fine and things are going to become bad towards the end. So if the error is zero, we need to ask ourselves, is it zero because the optimization goals were met or is it zero because uh, of that issue that we spoke about, right? And to sort of get out of this uh, dilemma of inertia that we have of like, uh, we, are at, we are at zero state, it's all good. Uh, we, we need some wiggle room here. And if we always cap our target utilization to be 25 and not move beyond that, we essentially saturate at that point. So in order to try and mitigate this, what ended up happening was we extended the 25% by five more percent. And we do mark assists in this state to try and determine if we are actually underpacing, overpacing, or pacing at pace. Um, so that's where the 5% extension comes from. The issue with the 5% extension is that we now introduce mark assists in the steady state, meaning that we are essentially stealing 5% more from the application go routines. So that sounds great and everything. What is the downside here? Downside one, where non-heap sources of work are not negligible, that is, let's say you have a program with a lot of go routines, and there's the amount of stack memory that you have is way more than the amount of heap memory that you have. This is a case where the GC pacer will not make the wisest of decisions. And this is because it does not take into account stack sources of work and global sources of work. Uh, it only takes into account heap sources of work. Downside two is when GoGC is large. If you end up setting a large GoGC value, which some of us might have, um, to try and like reduce GC, uh, to try and reduce latency hits due to GC, what this means is, with a large GoGC value, there is a lot of runway in terms of how much the heap can grow in the future. And if at any point, all of that memory turns out to be live, the pacer now has all of this unforeseen amount of GC work that it needs to do and it didn't anticipate. So in order to try and meet the goal, it will try and ramp up uh, mark assists a lot. This means that you are going to starve your application go routines and it's going to take multiple cycles to try and recover from this, uh, try and recover from this effect. So that's the second downside. The third downside is the steady state error of the P controller will never converge to zero. Uh, that's the disadvantage of a P controller itself. Mark assists are part of the steady state, 5% uh, extension from the 25% goal. So let's talk about, finally talk about the redesign of the GC pacer. Uh, major trends of this were, we now include non-heap sources of work. We include, we reframe the pacing decision as a search problem. We use a PI controller and we change the target CPU utilization to 25%, back from 30%. We'll talk about how. So including non-heap sources of work, we now include stacks and globals, which means our definition of the heap goal can now be extended from our previous definition by just simply including stacks and globals as well. Uh, this is intuitively the right thing to do because we are trading off CPU for these sources of work as well, which is the right thing to do. However, it changes the behavior of GoGC as compared to what was earlier on. What I mean by this is that the value of the heap goal is always, almost always going to be higher than what's calculated if we didn't include stacks and globals. And what this means is that each GC cycle, we are going to end up using more memory. And your application is going to end up using more memory uh, 
uh, after the change to go 1.18 if it has um, a significant amount of non-heap memory that is being used. So let's take a step back for a minute and lay the groundwork for what we're about to discuss next. So the GC pacer knows two notions of time. It knows, it, it knows the time taken to allocate after we trigger a GC cycle, and it knows the time taken to perform GC work. Ideally, the pacer needs to complete these two uh, notions of time in the same amount uh, relative to a wall clock, because by the time we are done allocating, we would also like to be done scanning, because at that point, we can perform things like sweeping up garbage, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, this is the most ideal scenario. So in the steady state, the amount of GC work is roughly going to be constant because of how we defined our study set. So that is constant allocation rate, constant heap size. So the amount of GC work that we do have in the steady state is going to be roughly constant. Um, so continuing from this, our application can spend time either in it, either doing work in itself, could be allocating to, or doing GC work. So these two notions of time could be thought of as bytes allocated or bytes scanned. Considering that bytes scanned is going to be roughly constant, the question that we asked earlier of how early do we need to start a GC cycle is essentially trying to figure out how many bytes have we allocated so far. So uh, the byte scanned is going to be proportional to the uh, bytes allocated. And the way that we represent that is BA is equal to some constant times the bytes allocated. And that constant we define as uh, R henceforth. So the big idea behind the redesign is that this R acts as a conversion factor between these two notions of time. That is, if we know one of them, we can calculate the other and vice versa. Uh, subsequently, we'd also like these two notions of time to complete at the same time, but also while maintaining target CPU utilization. So um, additionally, we also scale this value of R taking into account what the target utilization is and what our current utilization is. The reason for doing this is that whenever we estimate a value of R, we would like that estimated value to be at target utilization. And we will soon see why that's the case. Now, if we know what our goal is, and we know somehow how many bytes are allocated in a GC cycle, we can reliably calculate when we should start a GC cycle. Because the only problem that we had was application was allocating while the GC was going on. So if we know what our goal is and we know how many bytes are going to be allocated, we can probably track back from the goal and start the GC cycle at that point in order to try and figure out uh, how early we need to go. So that essentially looks like this, uh, HG minus R into the byte scan. R into the byte scan is essentially bytes allocated. So this is an estimate of how early we need to start. However, intuitively, the size of the live heap when we start the GC cycle will always be greater than or equal to the trigger size. It doesn't make sense for the trigger size to be greater than the live heap size. And uh, substituting that back, we now have a condition rather than a predetermined trigger point as we did earlier. That is, earlier we were calculating what the trigger of the heap should be, but now we have a condition that encapsulates both our optimization goals. So uh, we now have a search space uh, as, as, as follows. We have our A, which is our life heap size, which is always greater than or equal to that term. And somewhere in this search space lies our trigger point that we need to search for over here. We know what the value of the heap goal is. We know how many bytes we've scanned. Uh, the only thing remaining is calculating and estimating R. We now need to search for R in this search space, which now encapsulates both of our optimization goals which essentially means we've converted our problem of pacing from an optimization problem to a search problem. OK, so how do we calculate GC over a GC cycle, right? We use, uh, how do we calculate R over a GC cycle? We use R to estimate the bytes allocated. But let's try and see if we can reverse engineer that a little bit in order to get an estimate of what R itself might look like. Um, so at the end of a GC cycle, the bytes allocated is simply what the peak live heap was since uh, minus what the uh, heap size was when we triggered it, which is essentially the amount that we have allocated since a GC cycle began. And we can calculate this at the end of a GC cycle. We know what uh, the bytes scanned is because the runtime can accurately keep track of how many bytes it scanned. So this value can be calculated at the end of GC cycle. 
and this is an accurate estimate, uh, this is an accurate calculation of what the bytes allocated value is, which means that this is the R value that should have been used in order for us to meet our target. So this is the optimal R value, which we can only get at the end of a GC cycle, but we need this R value at the beginning of a GC cycle. So this is what the ideal value is. However, uh, a good a, a plus side over here is that in the steady state, we would expect the next GC to also be similar in nature because constant allocation rate, constant heap size, all of that. So if we know if we know an ideal value of R at this cycle, can we just use this value of R for the next cycle and then recompute it for the next cycle and use for the next one and so on and so forth? It seems like a nice calculation. It seems like a nice estimate to use, to be honest. However, it turns out that this value of R is using it directly is is noisy in nature, and it might end up missing the target. So when I say it's noisy in nature, what I mean is it might have transient states, more transient states than one might expect, and it might stay in the transient state longer than one might expect. So in order to smooth out the transient noise and the transient changes, we make use of a PI controller. And the set value that we do is essentially the calculated R value that we would have used if not for the PI controller. Now that is the set value for this controller, and we try and use a controller in order to smooth out any noise that we might encounter in the future. So the controller might bounce around a little bit, but it might bounce around a, a global average of R that is an, a better estimate than what we would have used if we just used the raw value of R previously. What this looks like is as follows. If we enable the Go Debug GC uh, pacer trace option. This gives us a bunch of pacer debugging information. One such piece of information being the R value itself. Now, uh, I modified the source code of the Go runtime in order to get rid of the controller and directly use this R value. And I ran the garbage collection benchmark that is defined in the Go in the, in the Golang benchmarks repository. And to sort of compare what the R values look like without a controller and with a controller, it's, it's something like this. Um, so with a controller, which is the red line over there, um, we might flop around a little bit more, but we are flopping around an average which is different from the average that we would have gotten if we didn't use a controller at all. And uh, the design postulates that this other average that the PI controller sort of fluctuates around is a better global average than our other um, uh, value that we would have used if we didn't use a controller at all. So due to this way of doing things, we reframe our pacing problem and no longer suffer from the issue of the controller getting saturated from the PO term because we get, we've essentially redefined the way the error term works and we no longer have the issue of the error term becoming zero even if both our optimization goals aren't met. So, uh, we've reframed that problem, uh, which means we no longer require the extension or the wiggle room of the 5% mark assists that, that, are, uh, that we needed before, essentially. Um, so the goal utilization can now be reduced back to 25%, which is awesome, because this essentially means that we can improve application latencies now. So I, I wanted to try and see this improval of application latencies and uh, through a benchmark. So again, the garbage collection benchmark from the Golang benchmarks repository. Um, if you, if I ran it for Go 1.17 uh, and collected execution traces, part of the execution traces includes the MMU curve or the minimum mutator utilization curve. This essentially tells us how much CPU utilization was provided to our application Go routines, essentially. And if I just select mark assists over there and nothing else, we see that we get a utilization for the application to be 0 0.333. And if I run the same thing for Go 118, we get application utilization to be 0 0.452. A higher value here is better because it means that our application is getting more CPU uh, to run rather than uh, spending time in mark assists, basically. Awesome. Very, very interestingly, Kubernetes runs scalability tests upstream, and uh, the largest cluster that it runs it on is 5,000 nodes. When we made the change to go 1.18, pod startup latencies, which is a metric that we measure, the 99th percentile of that metric dropped by 10, 10x, essentially. And this was one of the reasons which led me to deep dive into this topic um, and see why things were happening the way that they were.
So this is also a very interesting and promising result that uh, because of the GC Pacer redesign was obtained. Okay, <sighs> that was a lot of talking. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but uh, till now, we have a little more to go. So uh, till now in our discussion of the redesign, we've spoken about including non-heap sources of work and pacing decisions, reframing the problem to a search problem, and making use of a PI controller for this search problem. This mitigates P controller disadvantages, that is controller steady state error not going to zero. Cases where non-heap sources of work are significant, we mitigate that by including that in the pacing decisions. And we again reduce the goal utilization of 25% from 30%. Great. But we had a fourth downside, which was what happens when GoGC values are large and we basically skyrocket mark assist rates and starving our application, right? Assists are always there to make things interesting. So assists come into play when we find more GC work than expected, essentially. The worst case is when all of our scannable memory turns out to be live. And the pacer essentially assumed that the worst case is likely to happen and bounded the heap growth to 1.1x. And more importantly, it tried to mitigate this uh, unforeseen amount of GC work in the same current cycle itself. What this means is if it had some amount of unforeseen GC work, it tried to ramp up assists in order to complete that work by the time the cycle ended. And this essentially was our problem of large Go GC values and overshooting the heap limit. Um, if we have large Go GC values, we have a larger runway and we don't do things uh, the way that we might want, it to, might want to do. And hence we starve the application Go routines taking multiple cycles to recover. The interesting thing to note here is that if we have all of this unforeseen live memory now, right, the next GC cycle is going to use this much live memory anyway. So why panic now and ramp up our assist rate when the next GC is going to use this much live memory anyway, or at least this much live memory anyway? So let's try and stay calm in this GC cycle and try and spread out our work into the next one as well. So this was like uh, a other major aspect of the redesign. So we cannot, but we cannot let this deferring shoot up the heap goal uh, to the next cycle either. We cannot let how much we defer um, basically affect what the heap goal is going to be for the next cycle, because that, that's not fair. So if we take the original live heap, right, that is what we have currently, the heap goal is as we already know, which is one plus go GC by 100 into that. And the heap goal for the next cycle, the worst case heap goal would be one plus go GC by 100 times that again. So if we assume go GC of 100, the worst case memory usage of the next GC cycle would be 4x, uh, the size of the original live heap. And maintaining this invariant, we now extend the hard heap goal of this cycle to be the worst case heap goal of the next cycle. So instead of just arbitrarily capping it to 1.1x, we now extend this to the worst case heap goal of the next cycle. Now, if we allow more memory usage in the current cycle, uh, because the next GC cycle is going to use this much uh, memory anyway, what this means essentially is previously, we might have recovered from the unforeseen GC work, but there's a very good chance we might not have as well. But now there is a slight possibility that your program memory consumption could spike up to 4x the original life heap size in extremely worst case scenarios. Actually, you know what, it's not, things are a little worse in the extreme worst case scenario. For the sake of robustness and in truly pathological scenarios, if things are way, way, way worse than we thought they would be, we still cap the growth to be 1.1 times that 4x. So the worst case would be 1.1 times that 4x. So how did these affect the Kubernetes release? We run scalability tests on different cluster sizes. Each cluster experienced a significant memory in increase. And this was because of uh, the redefinition of GoGC, basically. And uh, Essentially, a Go program experiences a noticeable increase in memory usage after switching to 118 if it has non-negligible amounts of, uh, of non-heap memory compared to heap memory. Uh, the solution is to tune GoGC, and the way we do it is if we equate uh, the old heap goal to the new heap goal and solve for the new GoGC value, essentially. 
that is if our mo's are old mn is the new and we solve for the new cozy c value um we can also derive mn from the previous mo as 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 seen here so a small note over here the soft memory limit ties into the gc pacer uh, the gc pacer now essentially the the heap goal that it sets is going to be a minimum of the heap goal that we saw and a value that is computed from the go mem limit uh, i wanted to talk about this a little bit over here mainly to leave breadcrumbs uh, for anyone working with go gc and go mem limit uh, simultaneously there is an excellent talk uh, that happened at a gofocon earlier this year by the author of go mem limit that you should uh, check out for sure um and it also you might experience a little more memory consumption here because of something known as death spirals so that's something if you want to look up please do so and these are a few references that i found incredibly helpful there's a lot of references which might be a good thing or a bad thing depending on you know <laughs> how you look at it but yeah thank you so much for uh, listening and i hope you have a great rest of the conference